Hello and welcome to my talk about the device tree, the other description for everybody. My name is Thomas Petazzoni and I have been working at Bootlin for over 12 years as the CTO and one of the Embedded Linux engineers. We are a consulting company providing Embedded Linux expertise uh, such as development, consulting and training to our customers in uh, fields like bootloader development, Linux kernel development, Yocto project and build boot. We do complete Linux BSP development, hardware support in bootloader and Linux, and we have a strong open source focus with a lot of upstreaming work and contributions, and our training materials are all freely available. I am also one of the co-maintainers of Beardroot, and I live in Toulouse in the south of France. So this talk is an update from a talk I did many years ago called Device Tree for Dummies back in 2013-2014. And in this talk, we are going to discuss what is the device tree, why we have the device tree, what is the basic syntax of the device tree, the principle of inheritance that exists in the device tree, what are the specification and the notion of device tree binding, how do we build and validate device trees, and most importantly, what are the common properties and a number of examples about device trees. So this is a slide showing an example uh, embedded platform which contains a system on chip in the middle in the gray box. This system on chip includes a number of CPU cores in blue and around it a number of peripherals such as GPIOs, Ethernet Mac, PCIe controller, GPU, DDR controllers and many others. This system on chip is then included into a board on which you have additional components such as a spy flash, a touchscreen controller, a DDR memory, a camera sensor, a display panel, an audio codec and more. And this typical embedded platform is important to keep in mind as the reason for the device tree is to describe the hardware that we have in such platforms. In such platforms, we have some hardware that is discoverable and some hardware that is not. So we have hardware buses that provide discoverability mechanisms. For example, on PCIe or USB buses, you don't need to know ahead of time what devices are connected on those buses. The devices can indeed be enumerated and identified at runtime using mechanisms that are part of the, the definition of those buses. You have the concept of vendor ID, product ID, device class in PCI and USB, which allows to uniquely identify a device and therefore the corresponding driver that is needed in the operating system. But there are many more other hardware buses that do not provide any discoverability mechanism. For example, I2C, SPI, OneWire or memory map devices are typically not dynamically discoverable. One needs to know what is connected on those buses, how they are connected to the rest of the system. And embedded systems typically make a lot of use of such buses. Indeed, I2C, SPI, memory map devices are very, very common in most embedded systems. So um, the hardware description is necessary for this non discoverable hardware. The operating system needs to somehow get the details uh, for things like the system on chip has two Cortex-A9 CPU core, two UART controller of this specific variant with registered at that address and the RQ line that one and the other UART controller with this other address for the registers and this other interrupt line that's the same system on chip as maybe three I2C controller of that other variant with register there and the interrupt line here and the input clock there. All those details the operating system simply cannot guess. This also applies to what, what uh, is available at the board level. For example, let's say you have a serious logic 4234 codec. How can the operating system guess that it is connected on the I2C bus 0 at slave address 45, connected to the I2C S interface 2 of the system on chip with the codecs providing the clocks, and that this codec has a reset signal connected to some GPIO of the system on chip? Again, all those details cannot be guessed by the operating system or the bootloader. They have somehow and need to be described either in code or some other data structure. So we have different possibilities to do that, to provide this description. It can be done directly in the operating system or bootloader code using compiled data structures, typically in C. And this is how it was done on most embedded platforms in Linux and U-Boot. But it was at some point considered not maintainable, sustainable, um, mainly on ARM32, which motivated for this specific architecture the move to another solution. Another solution that is, exists on some platforms is ACPI tables. This is the uh, widely used solution on x86 systems, but it is also now available on a few ARM64 platforms. 
In this case, the ACPI tables are provided by the firmware, so on x86 systems it would be your BIOS, that provides those tables uh, to the bootloader and to the operating system, and those tables describe the non-discoverable aspects of the hardware. Another solution, which is the main topic of the talk today, is the device tree. It is used on most embedded CPU architectures that run Linux, for example, ARC, ARM64, RISC-V, ARM32, PowerPC, Xtenza, MIPS, and a bunch of others. It originates from the PowerPC world and is not a Linux-specific solution. But it is now used in Linux, in U-Boot, in Bearbox, in the ARM Trusted Firmware, or TFA, in FreeBSD, and perhaps in other projects as well. Writing and or tweaking a device tree is now always necessary when you want to port Linux to a new board or support new hardware on one of those CPU architectures. So the principle of the device tree is that you write as a developer a tree data structure that describes the hardware in a format called device tree source, typically stored in a, with a .dts extension. This file that describes the hardware gets compiled to a more efficient representation called device tree blob or DTB, so the extension is .dtb, and this transformation from source to blob is done by the device tree compiler or DTC. The resulting DTB accurately describes the hardware platform in an OS agnostic way. And it can, for example, be linked directly inside a bootloader binary. This is what uBoot or Bearbox would do or it can be passed by the firmware or bootloader to the operating system, and this is what uh, would happen with Linux. So for example, nowadays when you boot Linux on an ARM 32-bit platform from a, the U-boot bootloader, you use the boot Z command, which takes the kernel address, where the kernel image has been loaded into RAM, and the device tree blob address. So the operating system really needs to have access to the device tree to be able to recognize what hardware is available and how it is organized. Here is a first look at the base syntax of the device tree. So on the right hand side of that slide, you can see a, a, an example of device tree with a number of comments. So it is really a tree of nodes that are separated by curly braces, a little bit like data structures in C. Uh, there is a root node that is labeled with slash and a number of sub-nodes, for example, node at zero is a node, node at one is another node at the same level at, as node zero, and child node at zero is a sub-node of node at zero. Each node has a name, in this case, node is a node name, child node is a node name, node um, is another node name. Um, and then each of those nodes have properties, and they are each have a name and a value, the property values can be uh, strings, can be integers, can be arrays of integers, can be booleans, so there are different types of, of properties. And pretty much in the, the usage of that device tree syntax for representing hardware, we will have one node representing a device or an IP block in a system on chip, while the properties will be there to describe the characteristics of a certain device. It should be kept in mind that the device tree compiler, DTC, only does syntax checking, no, and but no semantic validation. So DTC allows you to write completely arbitrary properties to com with completely arbitrary values. It only matters that um, the, the device tree is syntactically correct. So let's have a look at a simplified example of a device tree. On the right hand side, we have a very, very simple embedded system and that has a system on chip with two Cortex-A9 cores it has a DDR controller, a nice Corsi controller, a Geek interrupt controller, and a, a USB controller from the chip idea vendor. And on the left side, we see the device tree, which has been simplified a little bit with, with some nodes folded, and we will unfold them in the next slides. So we have a top-level uh, node, which really englobates uh, all the other uh, definitions, and it has a number of top-level properties, address cells and size cells, which we will be discussing later. It has a compatible property which identifies the platform as a whole, and we will again talk about the compatible property later. And then it has a number of sub-nodes. Some of those nodes are mandatory in the device tree specification, and some are really specific to each uh, platform. The CPU's sub-node is specified by the device tree spec, and it will contain description of the CPUs. Memory will describe the memory. Chosen will describe firmware-related information, and SOC, in this case, will describe uh, the devices inside the system on chip. So let's have a look at those sub-nodes, and starting with the CPU sub-node. 
So we have two CPU cores, so we have two subnodes, CPU at 0 and CPU at 1. Each of those nodes also has a label that you can see before the um, um, uh, colon, CPU 0, CPU 1. These uh, labels can later be used to refer to such nodes in other parts of the device tree, a little bit like you would have pointers in C. The device tree has a concept of P handle, which allows one property to point to another node using uh, this concept of label. So we, here we have two CPUs um, that uh, contain in your, our system. The next node is the one describing the memory, so the RAM that is attached to our system. Uh, it's a very simple uh, node which contains just a device type property saying this device is a memory and a rec property that gives the base address of the memory, physical base address and its size. The other sub-node that we have expanded here is chosen, which is a mechanism that allows the firmware or bootloader to pass extra information to the operating system, which is not exactly hardware description. For example, the boot args property will be used by the bootloader to pass the kernel command line to Linux. STD out pass is another variable that can specify what should be the default output for the kernel messages. And then we have the SOC subnode, which is actually uh, the most important one and where uh, the biggest part of the device tree will be. This node, whose name can be different from one platform to the other, again, this one is not specified by the device tree specification, uh, will be there to uh, encapsulate all the devices that we have in our system on chip and the devices that are connected to them. So for example, here we have the description of an interrupt controller, which is our geek interrupt controller. So it has a number of properties that describe this interrupt controller and we will discuss those properties later on. It describes an I2C controller and this I2C controller is interesting because not only the I2C controller itself is described, but we have a an, uh, EEPROM attached to this I2C controller at uh, slave address 52. And this uh, EEPROM, which is an I2C device, is described as a subnode of the I2C controller. So the device tree is a tree representation of the hardware that mimics the topology of the hardware. The EEPROM is connected to that I2C controller, so we represent the EEPROM as a subnode of that I2C controller. So if to this um, very I2C controller there was another I2C device, such as an audio codec for example, it would be also represented as a subnode of that I2C controller, just side by side with the EEPROM. Moving on, we have yet another device in our system on chip, which is a USB controller. And it is again described by a number of properties that we will discuss later on. But here you can see that no uh, USB device is described as a subnode. Indeed, USB is one of those buses that provide dynamic enumeration. So in the vast majority of the cases, there are no need to describe USB devices in the device tree. The USB controller will be able to enumerate them and discover them at runtime. So where do you find these device tree sources? Even though they are completely or at least supposedly operating system agnostic, there is currently no central and operating system neutral place to host device tree sources and share them between projects. Indeed, as we've seen, they're already used by Linux, by Uboot, by Bearbox, by TFA, by FreeBSD, and perhaps other projects as well. Uh, but there, there's no like neutral place to store them. So in practice, the Linux kernel source code can more or less be considered as the canonical location for device tree source files. So in Arch, ARM or Arch ARM64 boot DTS, this is where you would find for each CPU architecture the device tree files. Um, there are approximately you know, 4,700 device tree files as of Linux 5.10 and this is obviously growing and growing as we add support for more system on chip and more platforms. Those device tree files for Linux are sometimes duplicated or synced in uh, various other projects and this is what Uboot and Bearbox are doing for example. These device tree files are not monolithic. Um, instead of writing everything in one single DTS to describe your complete platform, we will typically split that into multiple files that can be reused between platforms. So we have the concept of DTSI files, which are device tree source include files, which can then be included into DTS files. Only DTS files are accepted as an input to the device tree compiler. So only DTS files can really be compiled but they can include any number of other DTSI files. So a very typical use case of this uh, inheritance inclusion mechanism 
is that DTSI files will typically contain the definition of what is inside the system on chip and then this DTSI describing the system on chip devices will be included in all the DTS files describing boards that use that system on chip. For example, uh, for the TI-AM335X uh, system on chip, which is quite popular as being used for the, the BeagleBone platform, there is one DTSI file describing the system on chip and all boards that use the AM335X system on chip will include the same DTSI and specify in addition to what is described in that DTSI the devices that are on their specific board. And this inclusion works by overlaying the tree of the DTS over the tree of the DTSI. And of course this can go on, on, on with multiple levels. This inclusion is done with the C preprocessor directive sharp include because all DTS files in Linux are passed through the C preprocessor before they are fed into the device tree compiler DTC. This most notably allows to use sharp defined definitions and provide like human readable constants instead of hard coded values. So here is an example uh, using the AM335X SOC as an example. So on the top left, you have the AM33XX DTSI, of course, just a very short portion of it, which describes one UART controller. So it describes a UART controller with a compatible property, a write property, an interrupt property, and a status property. You can see here that the status is disabled, which means that the device is not really used. And then on the top right, we have a DTS file, which describes a particular board that uses that SOC. It starts by including the DTSI, as I mentioned, and then this DTS is going to override or add additional properties to this serial port controller description. As you can see, the status is changed to be OK to indicate on this specific board the UART controller is actually used, so it, the device should be enabled by the operating system. And two additional properties, pin control names and pin control zero, are also added. At the bottom of the slide, you have what looks like the final DTB. Of course, in practice, the DTB is binary format, so it doesn't look like text file, but this is what you would get if you would decompile the DTB back into a source file. So what you see is really the combination of the DTSI plus the DTS, where the values specified in DTS win over the ones defined in the DTSI. Um, when you do such inheritance, uh, you have two ways to override values specified by a DTSI. You can either do like the example shown, replicate the hierarchy of nodes and at the same location define a property with the same name. So for example, in the case specified here at the um, left bottom, you would get uh, the status be OK in the final DTB. But another way of doing that is to use the label. And on this example, the serial node has a label called UART0. So you can replace uh, this uh, solution by the one on the right side, where in the DTS, instead of having to replicate the hierarchy all the way down to the specific node you're interested in, you can use this ampersand UR0 notation and just override that status property. This solution is actually now the preferred solution in at least in the Linux kernel for overriding properties from another DTSI you are including. How do you build device tree files? You typically don't build them manually. Uh, on ARM and ARM64, uh, there are make files in the kernel that indicate which device trees should be built depending on the platforms that are enabled in your kernel configuration. So for example, Arch, ARM64, Boot, DTS, Marvel, Makefile is enabling several device trees, and this is just a small uh, part of that, that file, which says that if config arc mvebu is enabled in your kernel configuration, this is one of the options for Marvel platforms, then the two device trees described there will be compiled. So you will get, as the result of the, device, the kernel build, two DTBs corresponding to those two hardware platforms. So if you run make to build your kernel, you would get those DTBs, but there is also an explicit make DTBs target that is available if you want to build just the DTBs. And during the kernel build, you will get messages like DTC and the name of the DTB, just like you can see the kernel building C files and sometimes assembly files as well. Um, there is now some work that has been done to validate device tree files. Um, as I mentioned, DTC is only doing syntactic validation, but we now have 
some YAML written specification of device tree. And this is a topic we're going to discuss later in this talk that allows to do semantic validation. And the Linux kernel has two new or relatively new targets in, the, in its build uh, system to help with that validation process. Make DT bindings check can verify that the YAML bindings are valid, that the YAML files can be parsed properly. While make DTBs check, we really check the DTS files that are in the kernel against all or one of the YAML binding that you can specify as an argument. And this is a very useful tool because the fact that DTC has only been doing syntactic validation has caused many people to, to lose uh, hours and hours looking for issues in their device trees and ended up finding that it was just a small typo in the property name or just a mix up in, in the values of the properties. And having validation at the semantic level allows to detect such um, uh, silly mistakes and hopefully fix them earlier. When you have booted a system or uh, Linux kernel with the device tree, you can also explore at runtime the device tree on the target simply to verify if you're running with the right device tree if it has the, the, the latest changes you have made so if you go in the sysfs file system in slash sys slash firmware slash device tree you can explore the device tree where each node of the device tree is a directory and each property is a file so you can cat all the properties you can cd into the nodes and really check what your device tree contains very useful debugging tool um, it is also possible to modify the device tree at runtime. Normally, the device tree is just loaded by the bootloader and passed as is to the kernel. But in practice, a, a few changes can be done or potentially more changes can be done. Um, U-Boot automatically patches the device tree block that is passed to Linux. First, to set the RAM base address and size. If you remember this memory top level node that we have in the device tree, you might have a default value in the DTS file you write, but in fact, U-Boot is going to override that with the exact RAM base address and size it has detected. U-Boot can also pass the kernel command line to Linux um, using the slash chosen slash boot args property that we have also discussed earlier. But it can also do other things like set the MAC address for, Mac for network interfaces, for example. There are additional um, device tree blob patching features that you can do in U-Boot. There is a set of FDT commons, and FDT stands for flattened device tree. This is basically the compiled device tree format, which U-Boot can, can modify with commons like FDT set, FDT MK node, FDT RM, and there's a whole bunch of other FDT commons as well. Another concept is the one of device tree overlays, uh, on which I'm going to spend a little bit more time. And the device tree overlays is there, are there to solve a specific use case of platforms that have some flexibility aspects that are difficult to describe in a static device tree. Um, typically, a, a, a use case are baseboards that, um, can, to which can be connected an arbitrary number of expansion boards. Um, for example, in the beagle board world, there are capes. You can connect expansion boards to your uh, beagle bone. Um, Raspberry Pi hats also of the same concept. Um, but another use case are FPGAs that contain arbitrary IP blocks that can be synthesized. And so this uh, gives some flexibility into the hardware, which has to be reflected in the description of that hardware in the device tree. And to support that, instead of writing another and another device tree for each of these combinations that exist between a baseboard and any number of expansion board that you connect to it, the concept of device tree overlay allows to uh, describe what is in your FPGA or what is in one of those expansion boards and have this device tree overlay be applied to a base device tree at boot time, a little bit like a patch to the device tree. Uh, so for example, such an overlay can describe um, a display panel that is on your expansion board or a bunch of relays that are on your expansion board or any other device that your expansion board contains. And this, the description of that device or devices will be um, added to the base device tree. U-Boot has support for applying device tree overlays, uh, so it can be done in U-Boot before ending over the device tree to the kernel. There is, however, no support in Linux for applying device tree overlays at runtime. If you want to see some examples of device tree overlays, you can look at the Linux kernel tree for the Raspberry Pi project. Um, this is where they store their overlays. <clears throat> 
So how does one know how to write the correct nodes and properties to describe a given hardware platform? Indeed, we have seen the overall syntax, then we've seen how the device tree gets compiled and passed to the operating system. But really, if you need to write your own device tree for your own platform, how do you do that? How do you know what to write? There's really two layers of documentation that are available. The first base layer is the device tree specification, which is available on devicetree.org. And it provides the base device tree syntax definition and specifies a number of standard properties. For example, the CPUs node, the memory node, the chosen node, and a few other aspects are described in that specification. But it is far from sufficient to describe the wide variety of hardware devices we have today. So in addition to that, we have the concept of device tree bindings, which are documents that each describe how a particular piece of uh, hardware should be described in the device tree. They are currently located a little bit like uh, the device tree files themselves in the Linux kernel sources in documentation slash device tree slash bindings. In theory, they are operating system agnostic, so they really have no place in the Linux kernel source code, but this is where they belong today. These bindings, which are documents, they are reviewed by the DT binding maintainer team of the Linux kernel, which ensure that bindings across different types of devices are reasonably consistent and that people don't come up with creative ideas on how to solve the same problems. There are two ways of writing such device tree binding documents. The legacy way, which are simple human readable text documents. But the new norm is to write them in YAML so that they can be used for device tree validation, as we have mentioned earlier. So here is an example of a legacy old style device tree binding document, which is there to um, describe the I2C controller used in Atmel no microchip platforms. And it says that if you want to describe in a device tree an I2C controller for those platforms, you need to create a node which has a number of required properties, compatible, reg, interrupts, address cells, size cells, and clocks. And then in addition, you can have optional properties. They can be there or they, can, they may not be there, such as clock frequency, DMAs, DMA names, SCL GPIOs, SDN GPIOs, and there are actually a, a number of others that I have cut just to make things fit on the slide. And then on the, on the right column, um, such device stream bindings typically come with an example showing how it can be used, and you can see them in use. So we again see this principle where we have one node describing the I2C controller and then as sub nodes we have the description of the devices connected to that I2C bus. Of course the device tree binding for those devices is another device tree binding document because those are other devices. The new format uh, in YAML is somewhat a little bit less readable as a human but uh, the benefit is that it is more easily uh, machine parsable for validation. And this document specifies how to write a device tree to describe the I2C controller of AM Logic SOCs. So it contains pretty much the same um, information, such as which properties are expected, which ones are required. So we can see the required uh, field says that compatible, reg, interrupts, and clocks are mandatory. And we can see that compatible can be one of those two values, that there must be one entry in the reg property, there must be one entry in the intro property, there must be um, at least uh, one entry in clocks. And then there is an example again that shows how it should be used. There are some principles in designing in the design of those bindings. The bindings should describe the hardware, like how the hardware factually is, but not the configuration of the hardware, like not how you personally choose to use the hardware. That is quite a bit of a distinction um, that they enforce when designing the device tree bindings. Also, the bindings should be operating system agnostic, which means that for a given piece of hardware, the device tree should ideally be the same for U-Boot, for FreeBSD, for Linux. So we really need to describe the hardware, but and not how it is used by a particular operating system. And also, there should be no need to change the device tree when updating the operating system. There is a backward compatibility requirement that they try to enforce. In practice, it is quite difficult to, um, to always enforce, but they try to enforce it. Um, so that when there are changes that are needed in device tree bindings, they should be backward compatible. Also, the device tree should describe the integration of the hardware components, but not the internals of hardware component details. 
So for example, the details of how a specific device or IP block is working internally um, does not belong to the device tree. What belongs to the device tree is the description of I have an IP block there, which is an I2C controller, and then how it is integrated with the rest of the system around it. It is integrated with the rest of the system as being located at that address for its I.O. registers. It is connected to this um, line of the interrupt controller. It is connected to this line of the DMA controller and so on. And same for devices outside of the system on chip. If you have an audio codec, you are not going to describe the internals of the audio codec, but just like the external signals that um, connected to the rest of the system. It's a data interface for audio, it's control interface to the processor, maybe it's reset signal and other signals that it, may, it might have. Of course, like all beautiful design principles, the principles that I have just described are sometimes violated um, just because it is uh, difficult to um, get them applied in all situations or also because the, the device tree has a history and in the initial steps of device tree usage on ARM, uh, some mistakes were made, which are somewhat still present in, in parts of the, of the kernel. So now let's have a look at a number of the properties in the device tree. And the, the most important property by far to explain is the compatible property. The compatible property is a list of strings from the most specific to the less specific. And this compatible property describes the specific binding to which the node complies. So this is the property that is going to say this node is describing this particular device using that specific um, device tree binding. And it uniquely identifies the programming model of the device. And this term programming model comes from the device tree specification. So essentially it means that if there is a given IP block such as an i 2 controller uh, which is uh, reused between system on chips we would typically have the same driver in the kernel for it because it's pro in the same device tree representation because it's programming model, which means it lists of registers and the meaning of the bits in those registers is the same. It's the same IP block. So we can reuse the same driver, but also reuse the same device tree representation for it. So practically speaking, this compatible string not only just says which device tree binding is used to represent that device, but it is also used by the operating system to find the appropriate driver for that device. So there, are, uh, it is kind of a free form string, which for real hardware uh, matches vendor comma model, uh, as you can see in the examples uh, uh, below, such as ARM comma ARM V8 timer or actions comma S900 dash UART for a UART controller uh, would be um, uh, um, compatible values for real hardware. The last two are for um, Linux kernel drivers, for regulators, fixed regulators, and for uh, keys over GPIOs, which are not like, like real hardware, it's more like what you do based on a given piece of hardware. There is also a special value that can be used for some compatible string called simple bus. This is um, the value that is used for a node in the device tree, which represents a bus where all subnodes are devices that are memory mapped. So it is very common that one of the top level nodes describing the, all the devices in your system on chip will use that uh, compatible um, value. In terms of association with the Linux kernel drivers, um, and this is how it gets done. A, for example, for memory map devices. In Linux, memory map devices are managed by what we call platform drivers. And each of those platform drivers registers in the Linux kernel a struct platform driver that you can see here at the bottom of the slide. It, uh, this structure contains a number of uh, function pointers such as probe and remove. But one of the things that matters to our discussion is the ID table field. It points um, here to a structure called IMXUART DT IDs, um, which contains the list of compatible strings that this driver is capable of supporting. And as you can see in this driver, each compatible string is associated to a data field uh, that I had to cut off for size reason, for space reasons, but that is different for each compatible string. Indeed, this very driver, which is a driver for the IMX UART controllers, is supporting four different types of uh, UART controllers, all coming from, from Freescale, but they have some small variations. They are not sufficient to warrant making different drivers for each, but still the driver needs to know 
um, whether it is an IMX 6Q type of UART, an IMX 53 type of UART, an IMX 1 type of UART, or an IMX 21 type of UART. And the compatible string will indicate that associated to a different data value that the rest of the driver can use to act slightly differently depending on the type of the UART. Um, besides this compatible property that mainly identifies the driver, we have a number of other uh, important properties that are commonly used. The right property has different meanings depending on the device that uses it. If it is used to describe a memory mapped device, the right property provides the base address and the size of the I.O. registers to communicate uh, with that device over the memory mapped bus. There can also be several entries if the device has multiple areas of registers. For I2C devices, the RAG property will contain the address of the device on the I2C bus. For SPI devices, it contains the ch chip select number. And every bus can give a slightly different meaning to the RAG property. Then we have properties to describe interrupts. Uh, interrupts will give the interrupt number and sometimes a bunch of flags related to it. Interrupt parent will point to the interrupt controller that is used for all the sub nodes um, in the device tree. While interrupts extended can provide bus at the same time. So it's a single property that allows you to give a pointer to the interrupt controller and the number of the interrupt that you want to use from that interrupt controller as well as a number of flags. Clocks is also widely used. It indicates um, which clock or clocks are used by your, uh, the device that you are currently describing and from which clock controller. DMAs, in a similar way, will describe which DMA controller your device is attached to and which channel of this DMA controller it is using. Status, that we have already mentioned uh, before, indicates whether the device should really be enabled or not by the system. So a status of OK means that the device is present and should be enabled by the operating system. Any other value would leave the device um, unused, almost as if it was not even described in the device tree. There are also pin control properties that describe the pin muxing requested by that uh, device. In the device tree, there is a concept of cell to encode integer values. So all integer values are encoded in 32-bit values, which are called cells. So the example here of the property foo is a property that has a value of just one cell. If you want to encode 64-bit values, you need the two cells of 32-bit. So in the new case, in the new example, foo has a, is a property with two cells of each 32-bit forming a 64-bit value. And then we have properties uh, such as sharp address cells and sharp size cells that indicate how many cells are used in the subnodes to encode the address and size in the right property. So first of all, let me make it clear. They start with sharp. They are not comments. Even my syntax highlighting gets it a bit wrong. They are in green because they are considered as comments, but they are not comments. They are really just properties whose names start with a sharp sign. So if we look at this SOC node, it says compatible equals simple bus, which again says every sub node describes a memory mapped device. One of the memory map device that we have is an I2C controller. But this SOC node also provides two properties for the number of address cells, one, and the number of size cells, one, that are used by the rank properties of the child nodes. So the rank property of our I2C controller has one cell for the address, which is F1001000, and one cell for the size, which is 1000. So this is the base address of the memory map register for the I2C controller and the size of the register area. But then this I2C controller node itself overrides those values and says for the sub nodes of me, the, address, the number of cells to encode the address will be one and the number of cells to encode the size will be zero. And indeed in the child node, which is a nice course EEPROM, we have a rank property which contains just 52, just one cell which encodes the address. And indeed, for I2C devices, we don't, they are not memory mapped. We don't have a notion of address and size. We have just an address, which is the slave address on the I2C bus. So we need just one address cells and zero size cell. This concept of cells applies to other things as well. For example, sharp interrupt cells is a property that is defined by a node in the device tree describing an interrupt controller. So in the example here, the first node in C describes an interrupt controller in your system on chip. And it says 
sharp intro cells equal two, which means that any device, such as the I2C controller described below, which says my intro controller is in C, and here we see an example of using a label to point to another node in the device tree. This pointer ampersand in C is called a P handle, and this is very common in the device tree syntax. And then the interrupts property must have two cells, here just arbitrary example 12, 24, because the target of the, um, uh, of the, uh, the P handle, which is our interrupt controller, has specified I need two cells in my interrupt specifiers. And this is because the interrupt controller driver will parse these two values, 12, 24, to find which interrupt is actually used by our I2C controller. And this goes on and on for sharp clock cells, sharp GPIO cells, sharp file cells, sharp PWM cells, sharp DMS cells, and so on and so forth. So here is an example again with our I2C controller, which has a clocks property pointing with a P handle to a clock controller um, identified by the CLKC label. And this clock controller has sharp clock cells three which means that it needs three additional cells to describe which clock is actually going to be used and perhaps with some flags. Here we have just put some arbitrary value for the example and the values are 12, 24, 32, which are those three cells uh, used to identify which clock from that controller we need to use for this I2C controller. Another very common pattern in the device tree is the usage of dash names properties. For example, here you can see um, an interrupts property and associated to it an interrupt names property. And the interrupts property has two entries. The first one is 0590 and the second one is 070. And the interrupt names property also has two entries, MAC RQ and MAC PMT. And those names can then be used by drivers to more easily identify which interrupt is what in the list of interrupt specifiers. So for example, the driver could do something like platform get RQ by name and ask what is the RQ called Mac RQ? And the device tree um, logic in, in the kernel would automatically find it is 0.59.0. There is another example with clocks which follows exactly the same rule. And this is again something we can find for many other properties, reg, reg names, GPIO, GPIO names, and so on and so on. So this kind of concludes our uh, visit of the device tree as a way of representing non-discoverable hardware. It is, as we've seen, a tree of nodes with nodes having properties. There is a standardization of how to describe a specific piece of hardware based on the device tree bindings. Uh, the device tree is a new description language which has lots of properties and sometimes the bindings are complex. Um, but it is no use for numerous CPU architectures widely used in Linux and outside of Linux as well, and it has definitely become a must-know for all embedded Linux developers. I hope this talk will have helped you understand device tree, and if that's not sufficient, do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you.